If we can move to another very important area of this industry, and that's, that's cost. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's an expensive task putting these turbines out there in the, in, uh, in the ocean. So how do you think over time some of these astronomical costs can be and will be reduced? Yeah, you have to look at where the costs are originating, um, you know, to see, you know, what areas can be attacked to bring down the costs. Yeah. And um, I think, uh, again, this is where we have to um, critically reappraise our inheritance of received wisdom. Um, that, that hasn't just come from onshore wind or wind, the wind industry a couple of decades ago, but from other industries where models are maybe... Um, adopted and transferred over to wind power industry where they're not really appropriate. So, for example, operational expenditure um, offshore yeah. is, um, is, is a key issue because yeah. of accessibility issues. Um, you know, if something breaks down, you can't just drive out to it to try and fix it. Um, so, um, a focus on reliability um, which, which will require a collaborative, proactive approach um, that, is, that differs from some of the kind of reactive approaches that we've seen adopted onshore, which have, which have been adopted from other sectors. So, for example, mm -hmm. um, in hydropower, you will have a small number of turbines in, in the well-controlled confines of a turbine hall, um, mm. exploiting a relatively benign resource that's you know, quite constant, um, and that can be inspected, you know, on a daily or an hourly basis. Yeah. Um, that that O and M model doesn't work with uh, you know an order of magnitude more turbines um, on your on your wind farm, um, which are inaccessible, and uh, they're not exploiting a benign resource, they're exploiting a highly variable and intermittent resource that's actively trying to break your turbine, <laughs> you know. So, um, so you have to adopt a different approach. Now, um, the, 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 I think one of the, the key things there is to get people talking to each other, get people acknowledging that good turbine performance is in everyone's interest. Um, at the moment, I feel there's a tendency for, say, people involved in development and people involved in uh, operations and maintenance not to communicate sufficiently, the the, the O and M people, um, and and the develop, development people, you know, in the, the, the pre construction phase, um, need to um, need to engage in a more joined up approach. Mm. Uh, introducing that, I don't think will happen naturally unless there's an effort either from uh, some some echelon with a strategic overview, you know, saying you guys talk to each other. Or from the third party consultant who um, can have a similar overview and um, will be engaged with different parties uh, and can help in this process of, of um, persuading people to adopt this collaborative, proactive approach. Um, so, yeah, it's really about just making sure you're not waiting for something to break. Mm. And, and it's entirely possible. I mean, the, there are solutions available. Um, which uh, which can be implemented that uh, involve you know monitoring of the operational data. Condition monitoring systems can be installed. The the, the routine operational data that are acquired by the by the, by the SCADA system can be inspected on a routine basis. And there are te techniques available that, that we use that uh, ensure that that can be done in a focused, cost effective way, mm. um, so that you can see signatures of incipient failure weeks or months in advance and intervene and inspect and, uh, and uh, sort a problem before it becomes a catastrophic failure. So, you know, you're talking about spending, you know, thousands or tens of thousands of pounds to avert hundreds of thousands of pounds of expenditure further down the line. So there's a saving, you know, that, that certainly brings the costs down when you can do that. Mm. Um, the, other, the other thing to bring costs down, I think... Um, Maybe one of the major things to do is to get it right pre-construction. Um, the uh, there are two sources of uncertainty, but broadly speaking, two broad sources of risk, if you like. There's the the kind of intrinsic variability of the resource over time, which 
you can't really do anything about. And then there's the extent to which you actually understand your site and have characterised your site, um, which um, hitherto has been quite incomplete to the, to the extent that, you know, sometimes you feel um, that uh, you're not really validating your wind flow models until you've put the turbines up and observed the productivity of them. And then you think, well, that's too late. Now I'm just using my turbines as large, expensive anemometers. Right. You, know, you should be you should be getting that level of detail in your in your site assessment pre-construction. Mm. And there are ways of doing that with, um, for example, second generation LIDARs that can survey um, in a detailed and precise manner, you know, a wide area and, and find um, features in, in the flow that you wouldn't you wouldn't be able to assess with with a, a single static mast, for example. Mm. Mm. How much would these lidars and the sort of the feasibility with these masts, etc., testing where the strongest flow is, etc., well, what type of uh, cost w would that incur compared with probably not going ahead and then finding out later that you haven't got it now? Well, in, in order to um, uh, obtain finance, you know, you have to have conducted a, a rigorous assessment of a project and identified areas of risk yeah. and a mitigants for those risks. And you can't do that without making measurements. That's right. um, so um, there isn't really um, a situation oh. where you wouldn't be making measurements. Sure. So then the, then the question is, how do I get the, the greatest reduction in project uncertainty for a given expenditure on data acquisition? Yeah. And you do find that um, there isn't a there isn't a one size fits all solution for that. You have mm. to use multiple techniques in a judicious way. Um, you know, uh, you'd probably look for some um, mast mounted cup anemometry for a, a long term, well, a, a, you know, a, a year or two yeah. of seasonally balanced data. Yeah. But for um, making sure that you understand what the wind is doing right across the rotor diameter um, in all your turbine locations, you would use some remote sensing like. Uh, like a galleon lidar, um, in a, in a complementary way to that. Um, so, uh, really, uh, what I find is our, our job is made slightly more difficult with uh, all these new options that we have. The in in the olden days, if you like, which could be last week probably. <laughs> but uh, you know, uh, the way you would design a measurement campaign would be determined by what you could measure, um, whereas. Now the techniques are available where you can say, well, what do I want to measure? And as soon as you say that, then you have to work a bit harder actually designing your measurement campaign. It's not being done for you by the limitations of your instrumentation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. OK. And as, as I suppose as technologies mature, then, you know, the technologies typically will come down in price as well. But what about um, the long-term supplier contractor relationships? And do they hold uh, a lot of potential in... Getting yeah, cost down over time. I, I think so. I think this is where um, we're talking about the commercial and contractual innovations yeah. as opposed to technical innovations yeah. that I mentioned earlier. I think um, we um, are seeing a, a shift in focus um, towards contracts that ha that cover a longer term and have have a, have a, some in incentivization for um, achieving reliability and and so on and yeah. I, certainly. I think that that's that's important. We need to make sure that um, everybody's interests are aligned with good performance. Sure. Yeah. Performance-rated wind farms. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and that will that will make sure that the alignment between the, the functions you were talking about earlier with with the pre and then the O and M will be yeah will be brought together. Yeah. yeah. Um, apart from the third-party consultant, as you mentioned, uh, overseeing is there any what other body would oversee to make sure that you know the two parties are actually talking to each other at the critical stages? Well, we, we are, we're also seeing a, a drive towards standardisation. I mean, there are existing standards, um, some of which are normative, some of which are just informative. So the, the extent to which they're adopted can, can, tends to vary. Um, but um, big suppliers mm. are, are keen on standardisation, not, not just of, for example, harmonisation between um, different countries' grids in order to make a super grid more viable, but um, standardisation even of con forms of contract and so on. 